probably more than two things. First, first thing, I want to know how in the world does your pastor leave on sabbatical and take power with him and just shut y'all down like that on Sunday morning? I wouldn't tolerate it. So you just, you know, I'll go on record for that. So, and, and, of course, John, bless you. Uh, Matt Duvall called me. I, 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 I uh, preach at a church in, in Macon on Sundays. So I'm driving down to Macon. Matt's driving from Rome to here. And he said something along the fact, you ain't going to believe this. But anyway, so anyway, uh, uh, but uh, kudos to everybody involved and to you, John, having to uh, uh, enter the fray of making decisions that uh, seminary, McAfee, or other places just are not going to prepare you for. But uh, good for that. Then secondly, thank you for being here today. I mean, you came back. Most of you came back, <laughs> and uh, and a couple of you just showed up, and you were probably thinking I was doing something else. So so good for you. Good for you. You're you're at least giving me a second try at this. Now, we're looking at Ecclesiastes tonight. So if you've got your Bibles, hang in there with me. If you don't, we're going to have texts of Scripture that are going to be on the slides. Uh, it, uh, you know, everybody has a different way of learning or or hearing. I, I kind of have to have my Bible with me because it's sort of arranged like I'm used to reading it, but everybody's got their own thing. But I am going to try to each week the scriptural references I'll pull on these uh, PowerPoint slides here. And so, so we're just going to kind of dig into this. Um, so now I want to just ask the open-ended question since so many of you talked about, well, I, I did my homework, I read through Ecclesiastes, Glenn's already told me I've got some explaining to do, so, so we'll try to cover that a little bit later. But what do you think? What, what are some observations that you either had because of the reading or you've already had because of Ecclesiastes? What circulated up? There is no right or wrong. I'm really interested in your impressions. So, it's what? Right. Oh, chapter three, right with the seasons, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that something you liked? Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Chapter three is probably the most familiar part of all of Ecclesiastes. That and the first verse of Ecclesiastes. So good. Uh, other observations. All right. Live your life. And that's kind of a New Testament nod, don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth, which is an interesting connection because Jesus did say that, right? Even though we're talking about Ecclesiastes here, you can almost see how maybe Ecclesiastes was uh, also an influential book, as it would be for the Jewish people and particularly for Jesus and his own proclamation. Uh, the, the what? The birds? You like that part? Yeah, okay, absolutely. We'll, we'll cover that. We're going to actually dig into chapter 3 next week, but that's that's fantastic uh, connection there. Others? All right, so one more question, then we'll kind of dig into this. W what do you think? Is Ecclesiastes the work of a curmudgeon or a crank or a sage? What do you think? Is he a grumpy old man or is this guy someone you want to learn from? Don't be afraid. It's okay. Someone you want to learn from. Please understand, scholars have differing opinions about this. Some very legitimate scholars say that this guy's an example of what not to be like when you get old. Uh, and then others will say, no, no, you're misunderstanding this. You're, you didn't see a curmudgeon in that? Okay, well, good. I think y'all are being nice to me tonight, but that's all right. That's right. You'll, you'll get over me in a week or two. I promise you that. Okay, well, let's, let's jump into this. So let's get to the next slide here. Um, um, there we go. We're going to talk about life's big questions formed in chapters 1 and 2. So we're going to do just chapters 1 and 2. Next week we're going to deal with chapter 3, and I know that's moving in a snail's pace, but the reason we're going to spend so much time in these first three chapters for, week, for this week and next week, is because it gives you the theological shaping of the remainder of the book. So I don't mean to suggest that the rest of the book is redundant or repetitive, but chapters 1, 2, and 3 
really do frame out the remainder of the book. So I don't want to wear us out on a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study in the remaining weeks, but the, tonight and next week is kind of important to sort of getting our head uh, around it. So chapters 1 and 2 really do tackle what we talked about last week, life's big questions. For example, the first one is, why am I here? The second one, um, uh, 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 what is the meaning of life? And thirdly, how can life best be lived? And finally, the question, will my life be significant? As I mentioned last week, I think those are pretty doggone good questions that we wrestle with all of our lives. You deal with it when you're young, you deal with it when you're middle age, and you deal with it in your latter age. All right, let's move on to the next slide here. So what's in a name? As I reminded you last week, the author of Ecclesiastes uh, has the Hebrew designation of Koheleth. Ecclesiastes comes from the Septuagint, which simply means teacher or preacher. Koheleth means assembler. So what we need to, as we interpret Ecclesiastes, have in mind, here's a person that's bringing a congregation together. I mean, li- li- you know, not every book in the Bible reads this way, but Ecclesiastes is intended to say these are words to an audience, large or small, bringing people together. Here's some things you need to hear. All right, let's move on. And Oh, Solomon, yeah, king or pseudonym. We talked about that last week. All right, next slide, please. All right, so four attempts for a full life. Toil, secondly, wisdom, thirdly, hedonism, and finally, despair. So in chapters 1 and 2, these are the four themes that the author is intending to address. So if the question is, how do I live a full life? And what the author is going to explore for us, well, you can work, you can be wise, you can eat, drink, and be merry, that's hedonism. Or you can just be despairing. He's going to actually give us a fifth option, which we'll get to at the conclusion here. All right, no point in wasting time. Let's move in there. So is work the answer to a full life? You don't have to answer that. (laughs) And his word for work is toil. That's the word that we read most in Ecclesiastes. The English translation is toil. Uh, And the idea is it's toilsome. I. John, was that you Sunday morning? I don't know. Was that <laughs> maybe inside? You know, preachers, we preachers can't look like that in front of you. But sometimes inside, that's what we're feeling like. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's one more thing. And every, everybody's job has something that's a little bit of a burden to it or a little bit of a toil to it. You know, Glenn, you speak glowingly of your years of service at Hilton. But there were some days when it was work. You were earning your paycheck and there's a reason why they call it work, right? So let's, let's dig into the scripture here. Uh, so chapters 1, verses 1 through 4, the words of the teacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the teacher, uh, all is vanity. What do people gain from all their toil, that is all their work, at which they work under the sun? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. We're going to keep reading here, verses 5. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Round and round goes the wind. And on its circuit the winds return. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, they continue to flow. I can't remember if I have another slide after that. Do I? Yes. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. And by the way, do you feel weary reading this? That's actually kind of the point. I mean, it's really sort of the point. On and on it goes. You've all heard the phrase when it's attributed to work, it's like a treadmill or the rat race. Those are our modern, that's, those are our modern phrases, but that's what Ecclesiastes is saying in this first chapter. All things are wearisome. More than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. It's already been in the ages before us. The people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come by those who come after them. I feel tired just reading that. And yet, we sense the truth in this, right? Now, we all know that there's newness, there's novelty, there's things that, 
every generation is experiencing for the first time. And yet there are parallels. It's like, well, no, we didn't have a pandemic growing up. But we had other things that changed the way we did things in life. Or we had the disappointments or the failures. And the complaints we have at work today, well, change the context and it may still read a little bit like before. So essentially what the author is simply saying here is that work is its own treadmill. And if you're going to try to find the answer to life by saying I'm going to immerse myself in my work, you're on a fool's errand. Now this is speaking from someone who feels very sincerely called of God. Now, I, I know not everybody uh, at the age of 18, since I am called to be a banker or called to be a lawyer, I'm, many people are, or called to be a doctor or called to be a farmhand or what have you, but for me it was a, a divine summons to use stained glass language, a calling of God. Um, but, but let me go on to say, and yet, even with my own confession of being called of God, my identity cannot be fully as that of a minister, any more than yours can be that of whatever your vocation or job was or is. We are more than the work we do. We are human beings, not human doings. Now, guys here in the room, we have a tough time with this. Even in the 21st century, men still largely, and this is gendered language, but I'll, I'll stake my reputation on it such as it is, men largely interpret their identity through the work they do. And so when men go through retirement, it's not unusual for that to be a very traumatic event. In fact, my wife has said, think long and hard before retiring because she's already looked at a divorce attorney because she knows we may not get along very well being together, you know, uh, and, and by the way, I'm a long ways off from, from retirement here. But, but that's a kind of a joking way to just simply say, I, I love to work. You know, I, I, I grew up in a dairy farm family. We begin our day at three in the morning. It's not a big deal. We enjoy what we do and we make the most of it. But my identity can never be about my work. I am more than the work I do. And one day I will retire. In fact, one day all of us will either retire, be fired, or die. But one day, sooner or later, we're not about our work. I, I, I'm, I've gotten to the age where I like to read obituaries. And, uh, any, well, you're laughing, so you must like to read them too. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm not in the obituary. But I like, you know, I, it's interesting that some people's obituaries, it's all about the work they did. And then you'll, you'll do the math and realize, but you live 30 more years. Aren't, aren't you more than the CEO of this or the leader of that? Or, I mean, aren't, aren't, aren't you more complicated than, than just that? So, so for me, it's kind of a reminder when my obituary is written, I mean, I, I, I hope it just says more than just what I did or what I thought I accomplished. So the author here is using ancient language to say, uh, speak a timeless truth. That's why I say Ecclesiastes is just as cur current today as it was over 2,000 years ago. We are more than our work. All right, let's move to the next slide if, if, if we can. Is wisdom the answer to a full life? How would you define wisdom before we go any further? Is it all about IQ? You know, standardized tests saying you're, you're, you're qualified to do this. You know, I see some of you shaking it. Well, well, what is wisdom? What do we mean by that? How would you define wisdom? All right, common sense. And not everybody's got it. There's a lot of smart people that don't have much of it. And, so, and there's a lot of un, uh, un, uh, uh, folks with lack of polish that are quite wise, right? Yeah. So wisdom to me in the biblical tradition is, is a combination of, yes, being one who has uh, uh, staked a claim in lifelong inquiry, wanting to learn and committed to being a lifelong learner, um, and mi mixing that with experience. So young people can be wise. That is, they, they want to learn and understand and they are reflective on their experiences. And by the way, young people have a lot to teach us older folks. A lot of wisdom there. Likewise, a person can have many years and no experience. 
or living the same experience over and over again. So I'm not going to split hairs on how the Bible defends wisdom, but particularly in the Hebrew tradition, there's an understanding of wisdom. Sophia in the Greek, I've lost what the Hebrew word is, but it's often personified in the feminine. We mentioned earlier that Ecclesiastes uses the feminine participle to describe Koheleth. So wisdom here uh, is perhaps a pursuit of life. Again, before I get into the text, we can appreciate this. I, I hope I, I hope that we can appreciate that wisdom seems to be a good way to be remembered. All right, and so I'm going to ask a playful question here: What are some of you doing to continue to learn? And what are new, let me say that differently, better: What are new things you're learning in your life? It has nothing to do with the degree or your work. Computer, Computer okay. For that matter, how many of you have had to learn Zoom in the last two years? Seriously, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you had to learn Zoom in the last two years? Yeah, I can remember talking, John, yeah, right. Uh, I can remember talking with neighbors in the first few months of the pandemic, helping them with their Zoom classes with aerobics you know, in my neighborhood and, and, and Zooming to church and things like that. So, so we all had to kind of, but all right, what are you learning that's new that you're enjoying? Yes. In a good way? Yes. I, I was hearing that positive because after a while it's overwhelming and maybe, you know, challenging. Well, that's a good word. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Engaging scripture. And, and by the way, p even people that grow up in a, a, um, a, a, a Bible-centered congregation or Bible-centered family, uh, oftentimes you don't have time while you're trying to raise a family or working your job and, and uh, preachers have a bad habit of assuming they're spending 10 hours a week studying scriptures when, well, no, you're not. You're having to do other parts of your life. All right, someone else that you're learning that's new to you. That's why you came here tonight, right? Learn something new. Okay, well, I'll tell you mine. Oh, yes, yes. Names and faces and the stories behind them, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, so y'all cut John some slack because I've been new in a congregation too, and it's funny how everybody expects John, I'm just using him hypothetically, to know everybody else, and you only got to know him. That's the only one you need to know. Yeah, I saw a hand back there. Innately bright. I like that. Yeah. Good. Those are good testimonials. Yes, absolutely. So the author of Ecclesiastes, we've moved from, all right, is work the answer? And basically he says no work is toil. It's neither good nor bad, but that's not the meaning of life. And so wisdom, wisdom seems like that makes some sense here. We are, I think, at our best when we're lifelong learners. Gerontologists tell us that one of the ways that we can help uh, improve memory is to always be committed to learning new things. Uh, Bill, you know folks that pick up the piano late in life, you know, have no music skills, but decide I'm going to learn a musical instrument. Or sing in choir, right, Bill? There's always room for one more in the choir loft. Try, stretch yourself, right? So those are good ways, and we can see those as life-giving here. Well, let's see what Ecclesiastes has to say about that. I said to myself, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I applied all my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also a chasing after the wind. Remember, that's a phrase that's used a lot. Um, For in much knowledge is much vexation, and those who increase knowledge increase sorrow let me read verse 18 one more time for in much wisdom is much vexation and those who increase knowledge increase sorrow what does he mean by that what do you think the 
more you know, the more you are exposed to the larger ramifications. Do you have a hand up or are you just... Yes, sir. And that's wisdom, by the way. Uh, wisdom is kind of understanding that, okay, you're on cloud nine now, but, you know, and it's not necessarily, you can be pessimistic, but it doesn't have to be, right? Right, you've heard the phrase, ignorance is bliss, right? Well, we know what that's meant by that, right? Sometimes it's just good, to, sometimes it feels good to be ignorant. So don't, don't misunderstand this as saying, all right, it's better to be ignorant, but it is acknowledging that if you're, if you're thinking you're going to think your way through to satisfaction, it's still going to be disappointing. You, know, you can learn that you have cancer, and you can read all about it, and usually that's what exactly happens when someone's giving a disappointing diagnosis. And, uh, uh, and you can understand, and it can, help, it, can help, uh, it can help in the healing process, but it ultimately is not the answer. That's a kind of a rough uh, uh, analogy there. I don't remember if I have another slide after that. I think that's how I wanted to conclude on, on this particular topic here. So, so what's the answer here? Does it mean ignorance? Do you just side on that? Or is it just simply saying, you know, in the pursuit of knowledge, uh, it's also going to pursue more complexity? Which is true, right? The more we know, the more complicated life can get. Now, John, I'm not going to talk about your experience at McAfee because I don't know what your experience at McAfee was like. I really don't. But I remember when I was a seminarian, and I know what I hear from seminarians today is that it's, it's often called deconstructing. They go to theology school, and everything their mama and them taught them is unlearned, and it can be painful. I mean, all of a sudden, you're learning the Bible in original language, and you're recognizing that, well, I thought this always meant that, but now I'm learning it's a lot more complicated than that. And, and I, again, I don't want to speak for anybody else. It's my experience, but I can remember thinking, I wish I could just be eight years old again. And, you know, what Billy Graham said was exactly the way it was going to be, and, and life just, but you, life gets complicated. So the more you know, the more responsibility it gives to you and the more complicated it can become. So it's not saying that ignorance is bliss, but it is saying that wisdom itself can be foolish if the end game is to say, if I can just outthink my way through this, I'll find life's answers. All right, let, now let's go to our next slide. So is hedonism the answer to life? Now, hedonism is a Greek word that essentially means pleasure-seeking, right? Here's something I learned today when I was working on the slide deck. Do not Google images for hedonism. <laughs> I, I had to sort through some pictures there. And I, I can't use that one. This will be my last Wednesday at Second Pond. <laughs> and I may not have a job in Mercer, but anyway. So that was the best picture I could come up with. I think it's like a 19th century romantic or something. I don't know. but So... All right, you learn, right? All right, so, so is the eat, drink, and be merry, is that the answer? You know, and by the way, let me just stick with this image for a moment here. When I said don't Google hedonism for images, uh, but what was funny, though, is that the images were not being satirical. It was real stuff going on. Uh, there, apparently, there's a whole travel industry that uses hedonism as, oh, Come to this carnival cruise or do this or that. And it's just, and it's like he, all your answers are going to be uh, resolved with $3,000 and a five day ticket to somewhere or what have you here. And so you think, so there's a market in this here. So let's, let's read some verses to this. And this is going to be, I think, in chapter two it is. All right, so I said to myself, Come now, I will make a test of pleasure. Yeah, I bet, a test of pleasure. But anyway, enjoy yourself. But again, this also was vanity. Remember, vanity is translated as breath, vapor. It just, it, it just comes and goes. Uh, I said of laughter, it's mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my mind how to cheer my body with wine. My mind's still guiding me with wisdom. It's kind of like I'm drinking but not too much. Uh, and how to lay hold on folly until I might see what was good for mortals to do under heaven. During the few days of their life, I made great works. I built houses. I 
planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of, of growing trees. In other words, you know, he's, it's not just eat, drink, and be merry, but he's, he's, he's buying things. Consumerism wouldn't be the word used then, but this person of great wealth is, is putting his wealth to, well, I'll just do everything I can and I'll consume all that I can. I think I have a slide after that. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Now, linger on verse 10 for just a moment. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toils. And this was my reward for all my toil. So in other words, I'm working hard. I deserve these good things. And I don't know if you do much in terms of buying things on the Internet. It's, it, you know, we're doing a lot more than we want to admit, and I'm not talking about with pandemic. So right now, uh, y'all pray for us, the Deloaches in Roswell, Georgia. We're, we, last year, in fact, Bill, you'll like this because this is a true story. My, I, I, mentioned, I may have mentioned last week my youngest son, who was a school teacher for a couple of years. He's married, stuck, not, just not, taking, not finding satisfaction in all of his toil, teaching science to sixth graders enlisted in the army we were not prepared for that my wife was not prepared for that so I said let's remodel the kitchen that was my way of doing a diversion right so you know now we fast forward and we've remodeled the kitchen and oh, what was the, what was happening this year I'm trying to remember what it was I'm not even sure what oh oh I know what it was it's and this is a little this is sadder but it, it but it's still, it's still the same logic so about two months ago our beloved dog we had to put to sleep it just it still breaks our heart you know and I just thought well we've been talking about remodeling the bathroom let's remodel the bathroom so now we're remodeling the bathroom and so a lot of things now you buy on the internet we I didn't know you could buy a bathtub on the internet, but you, it's easier to go to Home Depot's website and buy the bathtub than to find a bathtub at Home Depot. I digress by saying when you buy stuff on the internet, there's called cookies, and they get embedded in all of your searches, and all of a sudden stuff starts showing up, and you're thinking, well, I didn't know I needed a towel rack, but maybe I do need a towel rack because it keeps popping up on my feet, or maybe I need new faucets. Who knew? You know, all that stuff. So it's kind of interesting, that line, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. And I want to remind you, this was written over 2,000 years ago. We are still living in a culture, and the only thing different is that now this applies not only to rich rulers of 2,000 years ago, it's very current to us today. And I don't know if there's an age thing to it. I do, my suspicion is, is that when you're younger, that becomes a problem, right? One of the things we deal with a lot in school is student debt. And don't get me wrong, it's expensive to go to school, but sometimes our young people need good counseling because they think they need a three-bedroom apartment when it's just them. And I'm being a little, a little facetious, but not by much. There's, a, there's an old joke at Mercer that you can tell the faculty cars from the student cars, the students drive nicer cars. You know, so uh, it sounds like I'm making fun of young adults. I, I was young once too, right? And so there is this notion of, well, maybe I need this, and maybe I need that, or maybe I want this. And, I, and, and so he's saying, you know, I'm looking at all of these things, eat, drink, and be merry, consume, buy, Find your identity in what you own or what you possess. And you know the conclusion of this, right? Is there another slide on this one? No, nope, okay. So, so essentially, you're still on that rat race. You're still on the treadmill. You're still chasing your tail, forgive the language there. And even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat, as I think it was Carnegie once said there. So, all right, finally, despair. <laughs> Is despair the answer to a full life? And there's serious philosophical schools that actually focus on that. So nihilism, a German school of thought uh, in the 19th and 20th century. Nihilism essentially believes in nothing. You know, what's the use? We're going to die, right? So what's the point of it all? Let's move to this next slide. For there's no enduring remembrance of the wise 
or of fools, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten? How can the wise die just like fools? Are you catching his logic? Whether you're wise, successful, wealthy, have had a good time in your life, it doesn't matter. You're going to die. And that's, that's true. We, we know that's true. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity. Again, that phrase, a chasing after the wind. I think I've got another slide after that. So we're going to move to the conclusion of chapter 2. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and he even calls it a great evil. Are you tracking with him? You don't have to say I agree with him. But I think deep down, there's a part of us that go, yeah, I get you. I see what's happening. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain from which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. Oh, that strikes a chord. Even at night their minds do not rest. For those of us who've ever had a difficult night's sleep. This also is vanity. I'm not asking you whether you agree with it. Well, I'm not asking you whether you like it or not. I am asking, do you recognize some of this? Some of the things that we think are 21st century problems really are not. They're as ancient as the Bible. And so the author of Ecclesiastes, Koheleth, is giving voice to that. So remember, the original question is, is finding meaning in life. So can you find meaning in your work? Or maybe a better way to say this, is the purpose of life toil? Is it your work? Is it wisdom? Is it, is it hedonism? You know, do whatever you can to acquire all that you can? Or do you just despair of it? So how do we reconcile this? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to the next slide. I love Snoopy, by the way. Where am I going? What am I doing? What is the meaning of life? This sort of echoes how we began this. All right, now we go to the next slide. What's the point? In conclusion, there is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from Him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? So it's kind of one of these full circles, right? It's not that eating and drinking and work and enjoying all of the above is wrong or bad. It's having it in its proper relationship. And I know it's, I'm sounding like a preacher now, but I'm pointing to the text here. It roots it back into where is all of this from? How do you center want your life in relationship to the giver of all things of life? So it really is a matter of the balance or the relationship you bring to this. Because otherwise, if the success is, is exclusively based on what you accomplish, you'll soon recognize that, well, it's not going to mean anything. We mentioned this last week. I mean, um, the last two pastorates I've had, they have a picture of the pastor on the wall with the other pastors, right? And when I left Marietta, it, 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 I was 38 years old, 39 years old when I left Marietta. I'd been there about nine years. I was, I'm still young, right? Younger than John. <laughs> and, but it occurred to me that in a few years, some kid's going to be looking at my picture on that wall and they won't have one clue who I was or care. And, and it's true. <laughs> it's true. It's true in Augusta. It's going to be true at McAfee. I'm only as good as this current year's class because otherwise they're going to move on. Nowadays, John, if you mention Alan Culpepper to anybody that goes to McAfee, they just shrug their shoulders and go, Who? 
oh, I think we studied him in the, in, in the Johannine gospel class, but he's just, he's a person of history, right? So, right, we're all history here. So what's it all about? It's about rooting this in relationship here. Now, at the risk of sounding like I'm pandering, it's what we're doing tonight. We're coming here because it's a good meal, but it's probably not the best meal in Buckhead, I'm guessing. But it's a good meal. And the company here, y'all are good folks. I, I've been to Second Ponce a few times. I've had a positive encounter every time. But, you know, there's, there's good people everywhere. And, and, and you're, you're enduring a Bible study? Well, you can study the Bible on YouTube if you want to with much better teachers. But we come because somehow we need reminders around the table and in our gathering and later on at choir. Bill, I want to kick back if your choir goes up in number. That's a, but, but seriously, we do these things because it gives us the roots and the wings to find the perspective that we're going to need in life all the way through. That's why I love Ecclesiastes. He speaks a discomforting truth, but it's not a despairing truth. We'll read again this echoed in chapter 3 next week, this notion of eat, drink, enjoy your work. Remember, it's a gift of God, and it is. So for me, I try never to complain about my food. It may not be my favorite, but you know, I got food. That's a good thing. And work, oh yeah, even at McAfee School of Theology, uh, some days it's just work. <laughs> In fact, we, we were, um, we've been interviewing faculty members for a position. And we're gathered in this room and we go around and we ask all of the faculty and staff to introduce themselves and what their position is. And uh, so, you know, one by one they'll say, well, I'm Dr. So-and-so and I teach this or I'm uh, Reverend So-and-so and this is what I do at McAfee. And uh, for all of our candidates, when it came to me, and I, I knew that the candidate knew who I was, but I just simply said, my name is Greg Deloach and I write reports. Because that's all I feel like I do every single day. I work on reports and assessments and things like that. It's not glamorous, but you know what, my, my friends, it's work and it's okay. I'm grateful. I, I, I am grateful. I'm not saying I'm like this all the time, but for the most part, I'm trying to remember that every day is a gift of God. Every opportunity that we get to experience, good weather, bad weather, something to eat, something to give our minds attention to and our bodies to live towards. It's a gift of God. And that's going to be good enough. These gifts are going to be good enough. Any closing thoughts or pushbacks if you're thinking this is nuts? <laughs> I think Greg drank the Kool-Aid a long time ago. No, seriously, comment. I, I'm trusting you. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, your credentialing. It's almost like a resume that you want to say, wait a minute, I'm not applying for a job, I'm applying for a credential. So I think we need to emphasize in the education setting to convince students to care about the resume and what they're trying to get to do in their life. Remember the old saying, it's better to keep your mouth closed and be thought a fool than to open it and prove it. I had to get into my 40s before I realized, oh, they're talking about me here. I just need to be quiet and maybe, maybe there. But yeah, my, my dad, uh, uh, he's in a dementia journey um, and has been for almost 10 years. You know, he's, he's uh, independent and ambulatory, but, but his memory is just, he just has no short term, just none. But you can have good conversations about things a long time ago. He's very conversant. Uh, and and I'm, I'm always intrigued with uh, memory impairment, how it manifests in different people. For my father, it's really clear that um, 
for his, his, his struggle to remember, he is remembering the things that are most important to him. And that's, that's become really clear to me. And he often talks about his grandfather, my great-grandfather. And my great-grandfather was just another dairy farmer, n- never finished school, you know, and because farmers didn't finish school in the, in the early 20th century and so forth and before. There was no need to, for starters, and they didn't really have adequate education in rural Putnam County. Uh, but he talked about how he'd often spend time at my great-grandfather's house working through problems first as a when he was a young man and then when he was married and when he wanted to get his first house and stuff like that. and I, I've often thought about how my father remembers his grandfather my great-grandfather is a very wise man and it was nothing more than just an uneducated dairy farmer in middle Georgia that that nobody will remember outside of my family that's wisdom that's wisdom and there's no school that can confer that upon you you just have to earn that one well, I appreciate y'all's indulgence to be here. We're gonna, uh, I think you're going to find next week um, refreshing, I hope. Uh, chapter 3 is a, a section that we know well, and uh, uh, let's get together. Also, uh, as you chat with folks, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big one for encouraging church participation. If folks haven't been coming these last two weeks, they're not going to get lost. It's okay. Uh, they can, if they can only come one Wednesday night or the last couple of Wednesday nights, that's absolutely fine. None of this is going to hinge on having to be here the week before. So we're going to look at chapter 3 next week and uh, I think enjoy ourselves in that familiar piece of poetry there. Um, good to be here tonight. I'll close this, John, with prayer if that's all right. And uh, appreciate your time and we'll be hanging around a little bit afterwards. Let's pray together. God, we've gathered here in your wisdom. Because, God, really all things wise comes from above. So thank you, Lord, for abiding with us in our conversations, in our fellowship, in our questions asked or simply held in our hearts. And now as we go, abide with us still as we make our way back in your good keeping. In Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen and amen.